On the evening of December 28, 2016, Don Fluitt was on his way back to his Albuquerque, New Mexico home with his 11-year-old daughter, Sienna. The two had been visiting Don's mother in California for Christmas. They made a quick stop at Don's home before Don would take Sienna to meet up with her mother, Christine, who was Don's ex-wife. After dropping Sienna off with her mother, Christine, Don then headed back towards his home. A few hours had passed and any contact from Don went silent, and so his daughter Sienna quickly became concerned. Despite seeing her dad hours earlier, Sienna was a bit worried when he did not call that night to say goodnight, as apparently it was something that Don did every night. When Sienna did not hear from her dad again the next morning, she immediately called his work and learned that he had not gone in. Two of his co-workers reassured Sienna that Don was likely completely fine and that they would go to his house to check up on him. So that's exactly what they did. When they arrived at Don's home and knocked on the door, Don did not answer. They then entered the home through a side door and yelled for Don with no response. They then did a quick walkthrough of the home until entering Don's garage. This is when they would find the body of 54-year-old Don Fluitt lying on the garage floor due to what appeared to be the result of so-called homicidal rage. Don Fluitt was found with severe injuries to his head and a deep cut along the side of his neck. He laid on the garage floor, face up, surrounded in a disproportionately small puddle of blood. Don's co-workers then quickly dialed 911. The police arrived on the scene and entered the home. They walked through Don's house. and then entered the garage where Don's body was found. An investigation immediately began. What's the last time you guys talked to him? What's the last time you all talked to him? He was gone. He was like, he was like his sister died, just died. Oh, okay. He went to California okay. to his relatives, and they were supposed to be back. We thought he was coming back today. Yeah. And then the daughter said that they came in last night. Oh, yeah, they came in. The daughter was with them last night? Yeah. Yes, yeah. Okay. She, dropped, she was dropped off to her mother's house, and okay. I just told the mother what happened. We're okay. all hysterical. During the initial search, investigators were unable to discover any signs of forced entry or burglary as Don's wallet and cell phone were found on the kitchen counter. Investigators also noticed a fairly strong smell of bleach emanating from the garage as well as several empty bleach bottles sitting by a sink. After applying luminol, it was instantly confirmed that a cleanup attempt had been made, as traces of blood was found covering much more of the garage floor, as well as covering the walls of the sink. Investigators also found traces of blood throughout Don's kitchen and living room floors, and on multiple doors. The police then questioned Don's neighbors if they had noticed anything strange coming from Don's house over the past 24 hours. At first, all of Don's neighbors were at a complete loss for words and provided little to no information at all until one of the neighbors decided to check their home security camera system, and a shocking discovery was made. On the security camera footage, at exactly 7.24 p.m., Don can be seen leaving his driveway in his truck, and then shortly thereafter, a mysterious man appears and walks towards Don's garbage can. He would then look around, before placing Don's garbage can on its side on the side of the road. The man then walked back towards Don Fluid's home before exiting from the view of the camera. Shortly after, Don is then seen arriving back at home again and can be seen pulling into his driveway before opening his garage door. By watching the garage door opener light reflect off of the driveway surface, it can be noted that Don Fluitt first opened his garage door to enter the garage. He then quickly went on to shut the garage door behind him. Strangely, before the garage door could fully close, it appears to begin to reopen again. As the garage door finishes reopening, the light from the garage door opener can then be seen flashing on and off several times. The garage is then, finally, closed completely. The strange man that was seen at the beginning of this recording is never seen again. Shortly after this discovery, the police went on to question anybody that they believed may have had any bad blood or potential motive to harm Don. Investigators began by questioning Don's ex-wife, Christine, who told officers that while dropping off Sienna, Don mentioned that he believes somebody may have broken into his house while he was in California. And um, he said, it's weird, there's like cat hair in my dryer, and they someone used a, a pan in my house. Christine also stated that Don had a bad case of road rage and believed that he could have possibly angered the wrong driver. And he's had many heated exchanges as a driver. 
As the police investigated the leads provided by Christine, they also came upon information regarding an ongoing conflict between Don and his brother Dennis. The disagreement between the two brothers was regarding a truck that previously belonged to their father and was arranged to be sold and the profits split between the two brothers after their father's death. However, Don decided to keep the truck without further discussion with Dennis. Knowledge of this conflict led investigators to quickly become more and more suspicious of Dennis's involvement. So, Dennis was then contacted and questioned regarding the case. I got a little bit angry with him about that because he took a lot of my dad's stuff. There was just disagreements, just like just like I'm starting to see with, with my brother's death. Dennis was also questioned about why Don was let go from the fire department. Marijuana. Marijuana, okay. Nothing heavy. I guarantee my brother hasn't touched heavy drugs in 30 years. Dennis then offered investigators another potential suspect to look into. Dennis believed that Don's landlord, Benny Ruiz, had been acting strange and was likely the person who had entered Don's house while Don was in California. Dennis mentioned that just days following Don's murder, he actually found Benny inside of Don's house going through some of Don's belongings. You know, and it makes me mad. I mean, I, you know, I'm no, I'm, no, I'm no investigator. I'm no cop, you know, but... This guy spends two hours in my brother's house. You're talking about the landlord, Benny. Police then interviewed Benny Ruiz, and Benny went on to claim that him and Don were actually fairly close, and that the only reason he was in Don's house was to feed Don's pet dog. Benny was then also asked to provide a swab to test for DNA. Curiously, Benny seemed to point the finger back at Don's brother, Dennis, claiming that Dennis immediately contacted Benny, hoping to rent one of Benny's other homes close to Don's house. He said he was going to move all the Don stuff over there and set it up. Well, Did he tell you why he wanted to do that? For uh, Sienna. He wanted to set up for Sienna, for Don's little daughter, so which is kind of weird. Despite the suspicion of both Dennis and Benny, Investigators also began to look further into Don's life and marital history. After his first divorce, his first wife moved to Oklahoma with their two children. Then, after Don and his second wife, Christine, had divorced in 2009, Christine was remarried to a man by the name of Terry White in early 2016. And it appeared as though there was a custody dispute over their daughter Sienna going on between Don and Christine at the time of his murder. The information regarding this dispute immediately made Christine a person of interest. However, Christine was almost instantly ruled out, as she also seemed to have a solid alibi which was quickly corroborated. Investigators then decided to focus more on Christine's new husband, Terry White. Terry. Hi, Hi, you know, um, in the beginning, I would say it was Rocky. And if you can get me in any kind of way, violent or yell or scream at him, then make him look good, and he would ultimately, you know, win the court side about, you know, he'd get the daughter more. So I just, I wouldn't bite for that. And we're not going to find any DNA or fingerprints of yours anywhere in his house or on his vehicle or anywhere in that area? No. I, I just would not get in the guy's life. It's just, to me, it's not, it wasn't worth it. Because I love that little girl. Yeah. And I don't want to, uh, you know, make her, and they hate me because she loves her dad. During this interview, Terry made claims that he was actually very busy during the night of the murder visiting his sister until around 9 p.m., and then stopping at a Wendy's on his way to work. Once he arrived at work, he then ate his Wendy's in his car and napped for approximately 45 minutes until his shift began. So you napped the, in the parking lot at work? Yeah. Over the next few days after this interview, investigators made an attempt to fully corroborate the alibi that Terry had provided. However, some inconsistencies with Terry's story quickly appeared. Investigators were able to get their hands on surveillance footage of Terry's workplace parking lot that showed Terry arrive at work and immediately exit his vehicle and head inside, despite Terry initially claiming that he arrived at work early and ate his Wendy's, then napped in his vehicle for 45 minutes. So, investigators immediately brought Terry back in for a second interview. This time, Terry went on to claim that Wendy's was not his only stop on his way to work. He actually made a second stop at a Walmart to purchase a new sweater. Terry also claimed that he did not head directly into his workplace parking lot to eat and nap. Instead, he actually pulled into a dark, empty parking lot nearby before heading into work. Again, thank you for coming down. <laughs> uh, no worries, I'm sure you're a busy man. I stop at Walmart. I want to stop and get a, a new sweatshirt for me for work because my wife bought me a one for Christmas. And I said, I'm not going to wear that to work, so I, just, I went and bought this one. Now he's back, and he's like trying to protect Sienna from whatever. And it's just, it's making people feel kind of off. Due to the piling inconsistencies, investigators requested that Terry provide a DNA sample and his fingerprints. Terry cooperated and provided everything requested. 
Investigators also spoke to Dawn's brother, Dennis, again. You know, she's a mess. I mean, I talked to her for half an hour on the phone this morning, and there was probably four or five times she started crying. I mean, how do we know that Benny didn't go over there, and Dawn might have just let him in, and everything, like everybody knew each other, and then it and then it went bad. Do you have your eye on anybody in particular? Oh, you know, I can't tell you that. Come on, man. No, oh, I can't tell you that. <laughs> oh, that's right. I'm still not clear as a suspect. Nobody is. In my opinion, nobody is. Despite all of the information collected by investigators, as well as the list of three potential murderers, an arrest regarding the murder of Don Fluitt was yet to be made, and Don's direct family and friends started to believe that the case would go unsolved. Until just three months later, Don's fingernails were tested and came back with a match. The DNA under Don's fingernails matched Christine's new husband, Terry White. Officers immediately issued an arrest warrant and contacted Don's mother and brother, Dennis. We do have a suspect in this case, and we do have an arrest warrant. Yes! <laughs> it's Terry White. Officers immediately headed to Christine's house to arrest Terry, but upon their arrival... Christine told officers that Terry had recently gone missing and she had no idea where he could possibly be. Feeling deceived by Christine, a search warrant was filed in order to search Christine's home, vehicle, and cell phone. The warrant was approved and a search was immediately completed. During the search, officers found Christine's phone in the glove compartment of her car, wrapped in two pieces of paper. The two pieces of paper was a last will and testament for Terry White. The will was dated just three days after investigators requested Terry's DNA. Just under a month later, on April 1st, 2017, a highway patrol officer was traveling along a highway in Holbrook, Arizona, when they pulled off onto an on-route and truck stop. While passing through, they noticed a vehicle with a makeshift contraption that connected a tube from the exhaust of the vehicle into the cab. When the officer approached the window, they found Terry White still awake with a very red face looking back at them. After being arrested, Terry White was held in police custody while he continued to deny any involvement in the murder of Don Fluitt. Terry shared a cell with another man while awaiting his first court appearance. The inmate that Terry shared a cell with told his girlfriend that Terry confessed to the murder and that he has all of the details needed to convict him. The girlfriend then text messaged Don's brother Dennis regarding this information. Dennis then informed the police and the police spoke with the inmate. From what I understand, you want to talk about kind of what Terry's confiding you. Yes. This inmate outlined the entire night step by step. He stated that Terry told him that he waited outside of Don's home for Don to arrive home on the evening of December 28th. Terry noticed that Don was still with Sienna during the first stop at the house. So he waited until Don left to drop off Sienna with Christine. When Don left, Terry then went to the edge of the driveway to set up a distraction for Don by placing a garbage can on its side as Terry had hoped that Don would open the garage before picking it back up. When Don picked up the garbage can first, Terry had to improvise. And so, as Don went to close the garage door, Terry blocked it from closing with his hand as he laid on the floor outside of the garage. Terry then climbed underneath Don's truck inside the garage before the garage door closed. With knowledge of Don's smoking habits, Terry then got himself into a better position to attack Don and waited for Don to return to the garage to have a cigarette. As Don returned to the garage for his cigarette, Terry then attacked Don, beating him with a tire thumper, twisting his trachea, and then cutting him with a steak knife. Terry also mentioned to the inmate that he did a thorough cleanup of a very big mess. Initially, Don's family did not believe that Christine was involved in the murder, but at some point while he was in jail, Terry allegedly told the same inmate that Christine had pushed him to do this for your family. And in June of 2017, Christine was also arrested and charged with conspiracy to commit murder. She would later be released under supervision, but by April of 2018, charges were dropped pending an investigation. Terry White's trial began on June 11, 2018, and later that month, a jury found Terry White guilty of murder, aggravated murder, and tampering with evidence. He received a sentence of 30 years to life with an additional 12 years added in August of the same year. Terry, who was 51 at the time, maintained his innocence in court by saying, My counsel wanted me to apologize to the Fluitt family today, and I've always maintained my innocence and will continue to do so. So no, I'm not going to make an apology to the Fluitts for a murder that I didn't commit. Terry White is currently residing at the Lee County Correctional Facility in Hobbs, New Mexico.
Kirby man has been found guilty of stabbing to death his wife's ex-husband. The nearly week-long murder trial wrapped up today. News 13's Jackie Kent is live outside district court with what is next for Terry White. Jackie. Dean, in December 2016, Don Fluitt was found dead in the garage of his Northwest Albuquerque home. Today, his brother says the family is finally getting closure. Terry White guilty of first degree murder by a deliberate killing as charged in count one. Police say there was a custody battle underway between Christine and Don Fluitt over their 11 year old daughter. Police believe Christine encouraged her husband Terry White to kill Fluitt ahead of the custody hearing. During the trial, White's defense team flat out denied he was ever at the crime scene and urged the state could not prove he killed Fluitt. But today, a jury found White guilty on all counts, including first degree murder, aggravated burglary, and tampering with evidence. Fluitt's brother says this was a long time coming. Exhilaration, relief, um, justice has been served. He was an amazing guy, and he's 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 missed. Fluid's family rejoiced when the judge gave White the max of 42 years. But Fluid's brother says today was only half justice, with Christine currently walking free. The wife of of that man is the one who planned this murder. Make no mistake about it. She's raising my niece in another state, <clears throat> and until and until they charge her and try her and convict her, we're not going to have complete justice. Oh, you know, it uh, could be a lot better. How about you? Well, I never know if it's good to call you or not. You can try any time, and then, you know, we'll go from there, but there's uh, just a lot of stuff going on. Well, like I said, I don't know if it's ever a good time. I mean... Okay. I understand. I, I request you to come visit me. You had. I requested my sister visit me. She hasn't. So if you understand where I'm coming from, being on the inside, I have nobody. And it's right. nobody that cares because nobody's showing up as I requested. Do you understand oh. where I'm coming from? Yeah, I guess so. Um, if you knew what I've been told to, what to do and not to do, you would understand why. To come visit me? <sighs> Hey, yeah, uh, I'm going to make my way out that way today. I meant to be there much earlier, but it, uh, it's been tricky. How about um, money on my books? That would be appreciated. Okay, sounds good. I um, think about you, I miss you, and, uh, you know, wish we could uh, talk a little bit. I'll head out that way and see if I see you um, today. told her to come visit me? She doesn't want anything to do with going there. Sorry. Oh, man. I never thought in my life that my family would treat me like this. Ever. You can say that yeah. you've been treated whatever way, and I'm sorry it seems like that, but you don't know what we're going through. I'm going through my own hell. I have sent that message to you through your public defender. So that is the new news. I am going through hell. You are going through hell. That is that. I got briefed somewhat. Okay, well, I don't know what else to tell you, but I'm doing what I can, barely. Barely doing what I can, and that's that. So I will try to see you today. I will put money on your books, no problem. You're not forgotten. You're not unloved. You're not anything like that. We're going through our own, our own stuff. It's over the top. Let me ask you something, Wifey. Because, you know... You, you've asked me this before the f***ing shit came running down the hill, if there was another way, okay? Well. We cannot discuss anything, so I love you. We cannot discuss anything. If I get bonded, are you going to do anything you can to get me out of here? And where are you going to go? Uh, home. Where do you think I would go? I don't think you understand the situation, Well, I, I really don't. I don't. I don't think you understand the situation. There is no home anymore. There's no home. You're right. I don't understand the situation. And I know you feel completely alone. I love you. It's horrible. I, myself, in a world full of people out here, driving by, interacting with them, feel just as alone as you do. So I just want you to know that. Okay. Okay. So we're we're in the same boat, essentially. So. Uh, you know, well, whatever. I, a different kind of boat that I wanted us to be in. Uh, yes, I get it. <laughs> I get it. 
And there's other stuff I would love to bring out bring, or, or talk about or whatever, but it's just impossible. So, uh, no, I love you, and uh, we're both uh, doing what we can, and that's all we can do. And I have to just fight each moment not to be a, a blob on the ground. If you can talk anything else, you can say anything but about the case. As long as it's not about the case, so it doesn't matter. You, you can yeah. tell me about the house, uh, what you guys are going through, you know, all that. That doesn't matter. It doesn't affect my case. We just can't talk about the case. It's all tied in. I, I, I just need you to know, you and I in Siena, we would never live under the same roof again. I would have to... Uh, that's yeah. when I say there is no home. I don't know what to say to you. Well, let's say that, please. It sounds horrible, and it's hard to say. And if you understood all of the stuff that played out on this end, then you would understand. I don't know how else to say it, but it's horrible to have to say that to the husband. I think I, I understood that going into this, if I remember correctly. Okay. You have one minute left. Uh-oh. All right. Well, yes, I love you. With all my heart. Okay. Yo te amo. Yo te amo. Mwah.